Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Microsoft Project Made Easy. Today, we're going to be looking at some different hacks that you can do in Microsoft Project to avoid some problems that are very, very common uh, in the world of scheduling and project management, especially when you're using a productivity tool like Microsoft Project, it's easy to make a number of typos and mistakes uh, that really don't show up till later in the project. And depending on your experience level, we can all befall some of these uh, easy to uh, accomplish uh, mistakes that come up very quickly. So I've got this uh, schedule on my screen and um, it's a construction project that anybody could perhaps have uh, put together and it's got a schedule you can sort of see it over here uh, a bunch of activities um, listed out uh, we've got a work breakdown structure that's developed so you would have worked on it whatever your project may be you would have worked on it quite a while and what you want to do is review it and make sure it makes sense and I've worked with some very very uh, sophisticated companies and I've seen very simple mistakes that have caused a, a lot of uh, problems plus having uh, taught thousands of new users I know some of the pitfalls that that typically come up uh, when you do that well one of the things I'll mention and by the way if this seems a little bit advanced to you please click the subscribe icon and you can go on my playlist on my YouTube channel and you can start right from scratch early videos introduction and all of those types of things this particular video is kind of on hacks so you must be sophisticated enough that you know how to create a schedule and now it's making sure that it's actually correct and that you got a, like a checklist that pulls out some of the common um, errors so that you catch them. They're not really errors if you're still working on it and you're developing the schedule. Uh, but if you don't, then they end up that they're part of the plan. And then later on, you've got all these gaps and problems occurring or you've made commitments to clients or uh, some other uh, trade partners. And then that's causing all kinds of ripple effects in your project and it puts you in full reactive mode. So I'm going to look at this schedule and one of the first things that I talk about a lot in some of my other videos is to make sure that everything is connected and that you don't have any open ends. And an open end is where something is not connected because if you want to have a critical path, you want to make sure that you don't have any open ends in your schedule. So when you go down, you look at it, I'm seeing this and I see it in a break and this is like there's no connection on it and I see over here this is starting like on the start date and it, the framing is starting on the start date of this building which makes absolutely no sense but yet I see that on some schedules that people think they're finished now look well you haven't connected that up simple mistakes but it causes some um, problems very often so you have to kind of look at these uh, open ends now one of the ways that I tell people is number one you can do what I just said you can check and review the schedule and see if you see some connection breaks uh, going on on the schedule. And that might be easy to see in this view. It might not be so easy to see in this view because sometimes you got a lot of things going on like you do here with the link lines and it can get disruptive to actually follow it all the way through. I did catch um, that one, but I think there's more than one in this particular um, scenario or case. So let's take a look. One of the ways that other ways that you can do this is you can look at the predecessors and you can look at the successors. So best practices is, and this is following PMI, best practices and schedule, is that you should have everything connected. That means there should be no open ends. So obviously, if it doesn't need to connect then to anything, why are you even doing it? You're saying you don't really even have to get it done by the end of the project. Uh, on a predecessor, the predecessor, the first activity shouldn't have a predecessor and the last activity shouldn't have a successor. Also, your headings, they shouldn't have any uh, links to them. So they shouldn't have any links and nothing down here should be linked to a heading. That's another best practice. So as part of the work breakdown structure, these are areas of work. They're not specific items of work. So they're ways of organizing your project. So you'd want to do a review of that. 
Now that can be a little bit laborious uh, looking at it, uh, especially if you've got hundreds or thousands of activities. This one I think has about 120 activities or something like that. Um, what I would suggest you could do is you can filter this information. So you could filter the successors by clicking on the successors. And this is a great little check. It doesn't take you very long to do. I'm just going to click the select all, say blank, and I'm gonna click OK. And so I've got nothing there right now. So I should have, um, actually I do have something there. So I've got blank. So there, now you can see the activities that I have that are blank. And now you see a lot of the headings. Well, they shouldn't have anything, but I also see here, here, and here. So I see three and four that don't have a successor. So really the last one, that's the last one. Like I said, that's okay. So these three are problematic. So I could write them down 31, 32, and 41 as an example. They are not connected. Um, so they don't have successors. Now the other thing I can do is I can uh, click that, select all again, click OK, everything comes back. I should also do a check on the predecessors. So I'll go select all, I'll go uh, blank again, and um, just as a check, the first one doesn't have uh, um, a uh, predecessor. And look in here, I've got number 42. I suspect that that might fix itself, but let's see. So I'm gonna write down 42 here as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, think, take a look at that. That'll probably fix itself when we fix the other successors, but it's worth looking at. All right, so we've got um, those particular items. And by the way, if you've got a lot of headings and this kind of annoys you too, you could just shut those headings off. You could go to the Format tab and you could go to Summary Tasks and you could say, just show me only the activities and Summary Tasks will come back. So you can click it on, you can click it off. The big thing I'm gonna tell you is make sure you remember you put that filter on. It shows that little sort of funnel. Uh, otherwise, if you forget it, you might wonder where all your activities went. The third way I would also check is I would quite simply, I would go into the network diagram by sliding to the left and run a check there. And so I would look at my overall project and right here I can see this is starting frame interior walls way over here and it's way back there. So that doesn't look good to me. I might also catch some of the other open ends. Let's just show you how to do that though. In the view, always make sure if you're looking at the network that you've got all the subtasks opened up so that everything is um, clear and uh, visible and that you can see if there's any kinds of um, open ends. Ah, there they are, see? Even me, the trained mind here, <laughs> I missed them. So I see there, right here uh, and there. Uh, those two are not connected. So you, if they don't have that little link line there, they're not connected. And that is exactly why I like to check it in multiple views because it's very easy to miss. You would think I did that on purpose, uh, but I don't think I did in this case. Uh, so there they are. I can zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little bit better here uh, on your screen. Let's see, there we go. And so I can look too, you know, if this is install perimeter rigid insulation, and this is water supply rough in and gas rough in connection. If I'm saying, well, you know what, I want to connect this there, I can just grab that and let it go with the left uh, button on my mouse, grab it, pull it to where it needs to go and let it go. And I fix those two open ends right in the screen. I might find that this other one here, which was the framing one, it's pretty far to um, go, like I could, but sometimes it takes off on me when, it, when I do it in this view. Uh, I might do it here. I can grab it here, link it there, and now that's fixed those open ends. So now I don't have them anymore showing. So I just grabbed it, pulled it, and fixed it on the screen this way. Of course, I could have just gone to the Gantt chart and fixed it over here. So now if I check my successors, I should not see, if I go that filter route, I should not see any open ends except for the last one. So if I click OK, uh, and uh, there it is. The last activity 
is the only one which is total completion. So that's the only one that has a predecessor. I've just made it bold to signify the end of the project. It's not a summary task because you can see those are rolled up and that's a good way of checking that. Now I'm gonna uh, unfilter these. I'm gonna say select all, click OK, and then we'll see everything back. So that was the first hack. Make sure that you don't have any open ends and that your project uh, makes sense. And that is an important um, hack to uh, have. Now, the other thing that you might want to um, look at here is, do you have any unnecessary constraints? Uh, so I am always looking at the indicator column. And I hear, I can see uh, two constraints here. So I see I've got one for install ceiling tile, and I've got another one here. Uh, for commissioning startup. And uh, in this case, they haven't necessarily shut off the critical path. Sometimes they will shut off the critical path. So sometimes I could have uh, like a constraint here. Let's say if I put in 11, 23, somebody picked this date from the calendar, which I strongly advise against. Uh, and it says move the task, start on November 2. And move. No, I don't want to remove the link and keep the link because that's my, that way I don't have any open ends. But when I do that, you notice how everything before it kind of blued out. Well, that's basically because you put this constraint in place and now the critical path is shut off because if something gets done sooner behind it, it won't shorten the schedule. So what'll happen is it will shorten the schedule up to where the constraint is. Like it won't shorten um, the schedule beyond the constraint because you've said it can't, in this case, if you hover over it, can't start any earlier than that date. Uh, so my advice would be in that case, I'll move this back up to 12, would be if you see constraints, you got to ask yourself, why is that constraint there? Do I want that constraint there? You really try to avoid them as much as possible. And I would then look at, well, maybe I can get rid of it by putting a lag in one of the activities or adjusting it. But in this case, I'm going to remove it. You just double click on the activity and you could go to the advanced tab uh, and say constraint type, no constraints, which is as soon as possible. It doesn't say no constraints. As soon as possible is the same as no constraints. That's the default and that's gone. I'm going to get rid of this constraint too. So go to the same, double click on it as soon as possible. Uh, you would look at this to see if it moves any of your dates uh, when you do this and you do a, a quick analysis of each one to make sure it makes sense um, for you, right? So it would uh, make sense for you. So I just got rid of those three and now I should have a critical path right to the beginning of the project, uh, which is the red showing right up to the very beginning. So the critical path follows through this lineup. So that's number two. Check if there's any constraints. And if there are, if you can remove them, if, it, if it's practical, then I would do that. Uh, very often people don't even know they're putting in constraints, they're picking dates from here. And as soon as you do that, it puts a constraint. And there's a lot of different types of constraints, but generally they're not a great thing for something that uh, a schedule is iterative. It means you adjust it. It never stays fixed. Uh, you know, as Eisenhower said, um, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. Because that, what he meant by that is, you know, it's going to be iterative. It's going to be, you got to make adjustments. You got to be um, agile with these things. And uh, we have a very complex, we live in a very complex world and schedules are very complex. And so nothing goes exactly the way you planned. And you want to be able to look at it and see the impacts of something taking shorter or longer and how that's affecting everything else. So that's why for the most part, um, you avoid them. I'm never, I'm never going to say always, but when I look at an indicator column and I see a whole pile of constraints here, you know, it's great, you've got this plan, but then as soon as you want to start updating things, it's going to make you a little bit crazy in the software. So uh, you try to minimize them. There are times where you can do it, uh, like adding a change order that came out of nowhere and that sort of thing, uh, but it's much more rare than people think. So that would be um, the second one that I would um, think about with regards to um, constraints. 
Now, the third one that I would um, look at is over allocations. Maybe I've got to um, create a couple of over allocations here for you just so that you see it, but I would check this way. So on the resource sheet, um, let's say I had, uh, let's make this, so I have 200% here. So I've basically um, said I've got two laborers available. Maybe that was in your original plan. And then you end up with these over allocations occurring, right? So you've got these little red guys. I would check that. If you're doing a resource loaded schedule, you'd wanna know, have I added more resources than I said I had available? And this would be an important thing to check early on because you wanna look at that and you wanna say, well, does this make sense? Or what are we gonna do about it? And there's different ways of reviewing it. Number one, the indicator column is your friend. So always have the indicator column open. Some people delete it from view. Um, if it's not there in your screen, just go insert column, pick I for indicator, and then it will insert in your screen. Uh, and you can always delete it from view temporarily. But I really use this as an excellent tool. I can get a good sense of where the activities are. And I can see if I pull to the right, if I'm in the entry view, um, what the resource is that's over allocated. So right now I'm noticing that it is uh, laborers on all cases, right? So at least I know it's just one resource. That makes life a little bit easier. And so what I could also do then is I could, under the view tab, one of my checks would be that I would filter. So I would filter here for the actual resource uh, so I could just zoom in on it using resource, pull down, and I would look for the uh, labor um, resource right there and click OK. And now it's just only going to show me the activities that I've assigned the resource to. So I think I've assigned the resource um, to the construction heading. So that means we're going to have a laborer there the whole time. One laborer is going to be there the whole time. So that's what that means. And then I've also added a labor to some individual activities, right? And I've said in my resource sheet that at no point can I have more than three labors, was it? Two labors, I think I changed it, right? Let's go check again. Resource sheet, slide to the left, right click. And there it is, 200%. So I've said in my resource sheet, and that's what you'd wanna review, um, your resource sheet. Uh, so I'm going to go back. I think I got to pick that again. So I'll do using resource. It got rid of that filter. Uh, labors. Okay. So I'm going to look at that. Now you could also, so it's filtered. These are all the activities for um, labors. What I could do is I could split my screen. This is another way of looking. I find when you're a hack, when you're reviewing this and you're trying to get down um, to look at the details, you can click on this view and details and it'll split your screen. And what a lot of people, a lot of people know you can split the screen, but what a lot of people don't know is you can slide to the left, you can right click over here, and you've got the menu again that you can pick different viewpoints and you can use them collaboratively together. So what's useful is the histogram, which is the resource graph, and you click on that and it shows you for the different um, for the different uh, for the different resources what's going on. And I can actually pull this bar here just like you can normally do, so I can see more of my screen. And you can actually scroll along and look at what's going on with the various resources. So now you can see in this zone here you're over allocated for this particular. Uh, resource. So in this zone here, you've got um, a over allocation. So you've applied three resources to this activity and you've said you only have two available. So there's two right there, but there's also, there's also the one that is on the whole construction activity. So there's one on the whole construction up here. So that's why you've got three. So you could look at that and you could say, you know what? I don't want that. I want to have only one resource on that because I want to get rid of this over allocation. And then you could pick the resource tab, assign resources, 
And you could say, what if I made this 100%? And if you watch some of my other videos, you'd know that uh, Microsoft Project uses effort-driven scheduling. So if I make this um, 100%, which I, I just did, it just changed my duration over here, right? Let's maybe do that again. I'm gonna click undo. All right, so you see how that says two days. You have the resource over allocation over here, and you have said you've applied two there, and I've got one assigned to the overall activity because I'm saying I'm gonna have one there at the project the whole time. This is gonna be the one that fills in and does all the little in-between jobs. They're gonna be there the whole time. We budgeted for that. And then for specific jobs, we're bringing in extra laborers maybe from one of our other uh, projects. So we're bringing in two for this, but we said, well, we really only said we have one other one to bring that's available, so why are we bringing in two? So in this case, I would say, all right, well, let's make this one, right? And if I make that one, then this changes to four days. That's effort-driven scheduling. If two laborers takes two days, then one laborer should only take one day. Uh, so if two laborers take uh, two days, sorry, if two laborers take two days, then one laborer is going to take four days, right? Uh, so that's the, that's the difference. And that's not always true either, but that's giving you a good sense of what tends to go on. So we've reviewed that one, and then we can go along and we can check what's the other one. Maybe we decide, you know what? We could bring in an extra laborer. And if we scroll along here, we've got another overall location here, which again is one extra laborer. So we see that on the other two activities, uh, it's still putting us over by one, but maybe we decide, you know what, we're gonna hire another laborer. Well, if that's the case, what we can also do is we can go to our resource sheet, uh, we can look at our laborers, which we filtered, and we can say, all right, we're gonna bring in one extra laborer. This should get rid of these red guys completely. Um, from our uh, schedule. And so now we are good. Uh, we don't have any more over allocations on our project. So there's different ways you can do that. Now, of course, when I, I changed that one labor uh, and I made it uh, one less, so I added, I only had one labor instead of two labors on that activity, and it expanded to four days, if that activity was on the critical path, then it would delay my project, right? So if you're in the planning stage and you have a specific finish date and you're doing that, then you gotta look somewhere else on the project to save that time. And these are good things to be thinking about when you're reviewing um, the project um, from that uh, perspective that you wanna um, look at it and uh, review it. So I'm just going to now get rid of that, no filter. So I've got the project back and I'm gonna get rid of this details. So I'm just gonna uh, click there. Anytime you start splitting the screen and that, so you gotta be cognizant of how do I bring it back to normal, uh, which frustrates again, fairly new users in that sense. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention as a hack um, that you can um, think about uh, resolving on your uh, projects is I'll just use this little shortcut here, scroll to task, that brings it up on my screen, everything, that's another little hack there. Uh, the other thing that uh, you wanna think about is the work breakdown structure. Do you have everything aligned the way you want? And so you could actually take a look at the view uh, tab and you could go to where it says outline and you can say, show me just level one. Okay, that's the highest level, that's everything. All right, show me level two. Okay, so that's pre-construction, construction, close out, and total completion. I'm good with level two. I like how those are all in alignment there. So that looks good. So then I can say, show me level three. So level three is showing me pre-construction. I have site mobilization, substructure, slab on grade, and it's showing me the hierarchy of the breakdown of the activities, right? And you can decide, does this actually um, make sense for me on my project? Like maybe, for example, you see substructure and then you see utilities installation. You notice utilities installation is under substructure. Might make sense for how you wanna do your project, um, but maybe you're thinking, you know what? Uh, I want to have these on the same hierarchy as substructure. 
If that was the case, then that wouldn't be too difficult to do. You just go to the task tab and you'd say outdent it. And if you outdent it, then it's going to outdent all the subtasks. And now it's in the same alignment there. And if I go to view and I check out the outline view, I don't know, is that level three? I think so. Uh, then I should see utilities on the same alignment as level three over here of uh, my work breakdown structure. It's good to get it organized and get it all structured and set up so that uh, it has a nice even flow to it. And of course, if you want everything opened up, you just go all subtasks and everything is now opened up. The uh, next uh, productivity hack, so, that, so, so far we've looked at open ends, we've looked at resource over allocations, we've looked at constraints, and we've looked at a work breakdown structure. So the fifth um, hack that I would say would save you a lot of time is to review the critical path and make sure from a logical point of view it makes sense. And this can take a little bit of time. You actually got to go through the whole project looking at each red activity, which is on the critical path, the longest path to complete your project. If you're saying yours isn't lit up, make sure that you go to format and that you click it on so that you can see it. Uh, if you have constraints, it might shut it off. So that's another hack. Remember looking at the constraints to uh, take them out as possible. So you show and indicate a free flowing um, critical path on your project. And, review it and does this make sense and I would review it with everything open uh, I would also suggest if we take a lean construction point of view to project management I would suggest actually taking it and starting at the end and working backwards and see if this makes sense as well you know they say if you if you're having a problem with something invert look at it a different way and so there's no better way of looking at it from the end right and to, in order to totally complete, what's the last thing we're doing? We're getting the deposits recovered. We're uh, getting the consultant's letter of certification. So you're working backwards through the project to the beginning. It's, you've gone to this much trouble of putting the schedule together. So this review process will be very helpful in ensuring that you haven't missed anything. And then on top of that, once I've done it with all of the activities, I would even do it a uh, another time where I've actually then just filtered it to just show me only the critical path, critical tasks. So I just see the clear pathway that everything is connected and that makes sense uh, when I look at, look at it from that perspective. And some people or some projects, you might have a lot of up and down. It's like I can't really see things in order as they're occurring. Well, that would be another thing that helps you when you're looking at the critical path review it so again you could do another sort function that would be helpful I've got it filtered for the critical path or critical tasks only because I haven't linked anything to summary tasks I can just close those summary tasks right and so now I've got it sort of flowing and I could say organize this right sort from earliest to latest and if I've sorted it from earliest to latest, if I go down here, you notice how the, the numbers, they're not in order anymore. 47, 48, 49, 62, 63, where's 69, right? They're in a different order. They're in the order that the project is going to take place, which means you can actually look at the project and think, think about it from how it's gonna go from beginning to end, which is very, very helpful from that perspective for you to be able to watch how it goes from the very start to the very end in a nice even um, flow from uh, that perspective. Very useful uh, to do that. So those are the five productivity hacks uh, of reviewing Microsoft Project schedules. There's a lot more of them. And what I would do is I would develop a checklist which can be an invaluable tool so when you finish your roughing out of the schedule, you start reviewing it and making sure that you don't miss these particular uh, line items. And that'll be very, very helpful for you in the future. So I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day and happy project management practices to you. Bye for now.